Welcome to the another edition of the Open Forum. Again, we have another opportunity this evening uh, to look together into the Word of God, to look into this most marvelous and wonderful book God has given us to learn truth. And the, the beautiful thing about all of this is that when we get to the Bible, we have the ultimate authority. We never, never have to ask the question, I wonder if the writer of this book, the Bible, could have been in error, or we wonder if the writer of this book, the Bible, really knew what he was talking about. I've read many, many commentaries, and they will say, well, you know, uh, the book of Luke is very, very precise in what it talks about in connection with the Lord Jesus because uh, Luke must have been a very intelligent man with good resources from which to draw from as he wrote about this so that he could write with quite some authority. That, of course, is totally haywire. It's totally wrong. Uh, Luke was not the author of the book of Luke any more than uh, than Moses was the author of Genesis or Deuteronomy. It is God who was the author, and uh, therefore uh, that was the author both of the book of Luke and every other book of the Bible, including Genesis and Deuteronomy. And therefore, what was written was by someone who knew in the most minute detail, the absolute truth about what he was talking about. Now, the only reason that we don't uh, understand many parts of the Bible, or there are two reasons, once in a great while the translators have not done their best job, and, but when we go to the original language, we know we do have that very word right from the mouth of God, but secondly, God wrote the Bible so that it was very complex and truth has to be searched out. But at least we know when we are working with a verse in the Bible, I don't care which verse it is, wherever it is, we never, never, never have to question the original language in which it was written or the grammar in which it was written. We know that it is right from the mouth of God. And, and it is absolutely trustworthy, although it has to be understood in the light of the Bible. And God has to assist us in understanding. Uh, uh, that's why uh, God says that he would send the Holy Spirit and he would lead us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is no, no one else than God himself. So it makes a great... Uh, a great wonder and a great opportunity and a great privilege to have such an absolute authority. There's no other book that, of the millions of books that have been penned, there's not one that even can begin to approach the authority of the Bible or, or the truth of the Bible. And we have it in our hand and all we have to do is get busy and start reading it and reading it. And on this program, it's our desire that as we talk about this verse or that verse, that this will encourage you to look up those verses. And, and in the light of what you've heard, uh, that you see once, are we on right, the right track as we are understanding these verses? And so, Together, we come to truth, absolute truth. We, because when we finally have understood the Bible correctly, we know we have truth. That is, we can depend upon, we can hang our life on it. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. In incidentally, I don't know, we must be having a trouble with our phone line. The number is 
5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our first call? Yes, how are you, Mr. Campbell? Very well. I do. Okay, I get two questions. The first one is Matthew 8, uh, chapter 8, 21 and 22. Matthew 8, 21 and 22. There we read... Uh, in verse 20, let me begin there. Uh, Jesus said unto uh, a certain scribe who uh, uh, said to Jesus, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And now verse 21. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Now, we, when we look at this and we wonder, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Is he telling us that if we're going to follow Jesus and, and we have a, a, a family member who has just died, we can't even take time to arrange a, pop, a pr- proper burial for that uh, one who has died, that loved one who has died. We just have to forget about him, even though he hasn't been buried as yet. And no, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. But here is the problem. I try look at it this way. Here is an individual, and uh, this is not untypical, which says, you know, right now I am planning a marriage, or I am planning or just beginning a business, or I'm just going away to school. And I know it's very important to uh, to begin to be concerned about a right relationship with God through the Lord Jesus. But I am so busy right now with school. I'm so busy with uh, my business. I'm so busy arranging my marriage. Or I am taking care of my elderly father. And he's very aged and he needs a lot of care. And... Uh, and uh, uh, when he dies, or to use the other ideas, when I finally get through school, or finally when my business becomes uh, 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 not quite so busy, or finally when my marriage settles down, then I will begin to think seriously about my relationship with God. This verse emphasizing uh, when I... When my elderly father dies and I have buried him, uh, and that may take a, a little while, months or years, but then I'm going to get serious about coming to the Lord or about my relationship with Christ. And Christ says, let the dead bury the dead. In other words, uh, there are plenty of people who will take care of these matters, and you too can have, still have a responsibility, but there is a priority that comes in front of everything, and that priority is that we want to cry out to God for mercy and begin to be deeply concerned about our relationship with God. As a matter of fact, When we become deeply concerned about our relationship with God, then we'll even do a far better job in caring for our elderly father or whoever, whatever other task we might have. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. Hello? Yes. Hi. Uh... Can you take a look at uh, James chapter 4, verse 4? James chapter 4, verse 4. Let's look at that. James. Can you explain it for me? Yes, let's look at it. James 4, verse 4. 
We uh, read in verse 3, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now here you see God is teaching First of all, he's calling these people adulterers and adulteresses. In other words, he's speaking to men and women. And before we are saved, we are spiritually married to the Word of God. We don't know that, but the Bible tells us that's the way God looks at each human being. We are married to the law of God. You can read about that in the opening verses of Romans chapter 7. Now, every time we commit a sin, that is spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. We, and uh, what causes us to sin is our friendship with the world. We, uh, we were designed, uh, we were we were uh, created to love God and to have Him as number one in our minds and hearts and always be ready to serve Him. But the fact is we don't like that idea. We are far more fascinated by this world and all the delightful things this world can give to us. And so, in so doing, we are really living in complete enmity toward God. That's why it says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Uh, And if you're going to want more and more of this world, and why do we want the world? Is it because in so doing, we will serve God more more uh, righteously? Is it because then we can uh, be more faithful to God? The answer is no, no. The reason we want the world is to satisfy our own desires, our own lusts, uh, our own what we want, what I want. I'm number one. God is not number one. I'm number one. And I want what I want. And so we become an enemy of God because we were created to have our total service to God and not to ourselves. And so we become the enemy of God. And when we are are so interested in the things of this world. Now, it's true. We have to live in this world. We have to make a living and we can find uh, uh, some delights in this world. But my, my, do we have to be careful. That can always has to be subordinate, altogether subordinate to our relationship with Christ. If in if in desiring anything of the world it causes us to take our eye off Christ so that we're not serving Him the way we should, then we got, we are engaging in, in, in spiritual adultery. Now, of course, if we become a child of God, here is another point that has to be made in order to fill this out. The fact is that when we become saved, then we are no longer married to the law of God uh, because we have, in Christ we have died and we're like, we're a new creature. And now we are married to Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And because we have been given a new resurrected soul, which is what happens when we truly become saved, we will automatically have an intense desire to want Christ as number one in our life. That's the characteristic of our new resurrected soul. We, uh, we are only happy, happiest when we are doing the will of God. And the moment that we begin to, uh, to seek uh, the things of this world to satisfy ourselves and, and we find that it is treading upon our love for God we feel terribly disturbed because in our new soul we only want to do the will of God 
But thank you for sharing that very practical verse. And shall we take our next call, please? Hello, Mr. Campin? Yes. Yeah, um, Matthew 26, 57. Matthew 26. 57, 63, and 64. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. Now, if we drop down to verse 63 and 64, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter, or after here, shall ye, plural, shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, when did Caiaphas and the scribes and the elders see this? Because he said to them that ye, plural, shall see the Son of Man coming on the right hand of power in the clouds of heaven. Well, now, it's very interesting to help us understand this verse. Uh, Let me turn to John chapter 1. This is also from the mouth of God, and, and we will... Uh, uh, see uh, how we are to understand this. In John 1, we read uh, where Jesus is uh, in verse 51. And Jesus is talking to Nathaniel. He is, uh, he is at this time uh, bringing in Nathaniel into the Apostolic Twelve. Uh, he's going to be one of the apostles. And he said unto him, in verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter. Now that word hereafter is the same Greek words that we find here in Matthew 26, when Jesus said to uh, the high priest, hereafter. And actually, it is not, as we read it hereafter, it gives us the impression, a long time after. But actually, it consists of two Hebrew, or two Greek words, rather, that are literally saying, from now, from now. That is, any time after this moment, you, uh, from now. And let's see once how God used it in John 1, verse 51. From now ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now we search the Bible. Did did Nathaniel ever see heaven open and the angels ascending up and down on the Son of Man? And we know, no, that's not what God has in view. Christ spoke in parables. And remember, this, this verse ties back into the experiences of, of, uh, of Jacob when he was going into the land of Haran and he was at... Uh, uh, at Bethel, and he saw, he had a dream, and he saw heaven opened, and he saw a ladder, and he saw the angels ascending and descending. And this, this, and, and already we begin to get an idea what really is. Christ is the ladder. Christ is the ladder. Lad, ladder that, uh, upon which we can climb up to some place. And the angels are messengers. The word angel is the word that can also be translated messenger. And the messengers are the true believers. And when we become saved, we instantly are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. As we read in Ephesians chapter 2, when he saves us, we are seated with him in the heavenlies. But also instantly we are dispatched, as it were, to this earth to represent the gospel to this world. We are ambassadors of Christ. And so what Jesus was telling Nathaniel was, Nathaniel, you're going to see the business of the gospel going out into the world. As people do become saved and and become citizens of heaven and then are dispatched to this earth, as it were, they, we don't actually leave this earth, but in principle, that's the idea. We then are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus. All right, so Nathaniel, there's no way that he saw 
heaven open literally or Christ literally uh, uh, having angels ascend or descend on him. But it's a it's a parable illustrating God's salvation plan. Now, here is the, the chief, uh, the the uh, high priest. Now, the high priest knows a whole lot about the Messiah because he is a theologian. He is absolutely a theologian. He knows what the Bible has to say uh, in many places about what the, the Messiah would be. He also is intimately a part of what's happening to Jesus. He is going to see the Lord Jesus hanging on the cross. He is going to see that hour of darkness. Uh, He is going to experience that earthquake when all the graves were opened around the the base or around uh, that area of the Mount of Olives. He is going to know absolutely that Christ was buried because he is going to make sure uh, with the Roman soldiers that uh, with the with the uh, Roman uh, yes the Roman soldiers that uh, that there would be a guard that that body could not be taken out because he knows what Jesus had prophesied that he would rise the third day uh, he knows that on the third day that grave was empty because he and his people paid off the Roman soldiers so that. Uh, Uh, they would tell the lie that the disciples came and took him. He was thoroughly aware of all of this. And uh, so uh, he is seeing what he has read about in the Bible. He has seen that with his own eyes so that he knows that Jesus is the Son of God. He knows that uh, that, uh, this is the Christ, just as God has said, uh, from now, you are going to see the Son of God coming and, and uh, on the clouds of heaven. And you know, he knows that the Son of God is coming as the judge. And clouds of heaven have to do with the judge. For example, he would be aware of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 33. Let me turn to that a moment. No, 13. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, where, uh, remember, he's asking about, the, are you the Son of Man? And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven, and come to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting kingdom. He, he, he was a theologian. He could, he, would be able to see definitely that Christ tied into that. It didn't mean that he was surrendered to Christ. It doesn't mean that he wanted to serve Christ. He was in complete rebellion against Christ. But nevertheless, just being a theologian as he was and being quite well acquainted with messianic passages of the Old Testament and seeing the reality of all that happened to the Lord Jesus that fits so precisely into verses of the Old Testament. He saw Christ coming on the clouds of glory. That is spiritually, just like Nathaniel saw heaven open and the angels ascending and descending upon him, even though uh, they He did not see that literally, but in parabolic fashion, he saw it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Cammy. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, I'm a great show. I enjoy listening, uh, and I'm constantly learning. I have a a couple quick questions for you. Uh, I know you said that we're just beginning learning new information about you know, the death of Christ and uh, Noah's Ark and the dates, how you were rolled to the date 2011, correct? I, I'm so, sorry, would you... All right, so basically, what my, to cut to the chase, I just remember you saying that in 94, you also had a question mark on 2011. Yes. And I, want, and I wanted to know that then back in 94, you said... I thought it was 
You just discovered this about six months ago that 2011 was going to be May 21st. Oh, no. Well, yes. Now, we've said two different things. First of all, I've known for several years, quite a few years, that the focus was on the year 2011. But uh, but it was only much more recently that it, the information continued to gel. It can continue to come in from the Bible so that finally uh, it began to focus on on uh, May 21 and then on October 21 as the as the. Uh, more precise time. In other words, learning from the Bible is like learning in any subject. If you were in high school and you were taking taking uh, 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 geometry, for example, you didn't learn it all the first week. No, uh, I understand. Every but week you learn so more. Basically, basically, you had the 2011 and 94, but you come to learn that it was May 21st only about, what, six months ago? Well, I don't know how recently, but it it was uh, fairly recently, yes, that I okay. really began to learn. Question, uh, very good. You answered my question as far as that. The next question, I saw a Bible show on History's channel, and they were talking about a book, the book of Jubilee, and then there was some conflicting statements about Jesus' birthday, not was really not Christmas, which we know. Some were saying it was April and May. Some were saying, I think I heard from your station, where it was October the 2nd. Can you clarify that real quick? Well, I don't. I didn't see the show that you saw, but you must remember that until our day, uh, the, the precision that we're talking about today concerning the date of the birth of Christ, or concerning the crucifixion, or concerning the end of the church age, or the end of the world, was never known before. And there have been all kinds of. Uh, of uh, people in the past who have attempted uh, to come with uh, with some kind of a date uh, 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 when the earth was created or when Christ was uh, born and so on and they have never never been able to come to truth simply because it was not God's time for us to know those things until uh, the uh, during these recent years, as we are now, uh, God is opening up the Bible much more widely to us. So, but I don't know. You, uh, when people put a show together like that, they can get information from all kinds of sources, which don't mean that they have truth at all. But now I have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Um, I'd like to know where you get in the Bible that Jesus is coming in 2011. Well, well you, you, we don't, we can't find a sentence someplace or a paragraph in which it says, "Now hear this: Behold, in the year 2011, the Lord Jesus will uh, come to end this world." We don't find any kind of a sentence like that any more than we find a sentence that tells us plainly uh, what God's plan of salvation is, or what. Uh, uh, the crucifixion was all about or anything else we have to have to search the Bible and put lots of information together and make sure that we are listening only to the Bible and then when we find harmony with a, between a lot of pieces of information we can begin to come to accurate conclusions and we know we have accurate conclusions when they will stand the scrutiny of anything else that we might find in the Bible as we go along and it's the same thing with the time line of history. We had to begin with, first of all, understanding how God wrote about uh, the time information in the Bible, reaching all the way back to creation and, and all the major events that occurred subsequent to that. And then finally, as we learn 
more and more how God has written uh, these things. We project them. To, uh, we can project them all the way to the end, and then we find that we have harmony when we realize that all the, the all the information in the Bible finally focuses on the year 2011. For example, just uh, this is this is not what is the way we determine this, but this is one of the pieces of information we find. We find, for example, there was a, a great judgment come upon this earth in the days of Noah, when the whole, all the peoples of the world, except eight people in the ark, were destroyed, and we learn from the timeline of the Bible that that was exactly 6,000 years and 23, 6,023 years after Christ began uh, the, the, when, uh, the week that God created the heavens and the earth. Then when we uh, uh, finally ended up with 2011, we discovered it's exactly 13,000 plus 23 years, the same formula, if you will, that we come to the year 2011. We find, for example, that 2011 turned out to be exactly 7,000 years after the the flood of Noah's day. Now, these are only uh, pieces of information that come to us after we have first work carefully through a whole lot of information in the Bible to arrive at these times. And then we find many proofs that help us to, to be certain that we have done this accurately. But there's no way that I, in, in uh, the answer to an open forum question, can tell you where do we find all this information. It's all from the Bible. And as a matter of fact, uh, our family right now, radio right now, is producing a book uh, which will be called uh, We're Almost There, will be the entire title of the book. And uh, it will give in, in great detail or sufficient detail, maybe that's a better way to put it, as to how these dates were arrived at and some of the proofs that show that we know we are very accurate in this. And as soon as that's available, we'll announce it, and you, they'll, these books will be made free of charge to you. Hello? Yes. Well, we said in um, Matthews um, 2450, the Lord... Um, 2450, the Lord of thy servants shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. So nobody knows what day, what year, what time the Lord is coming back. Well, you know, uh, uh, we get this question repeatedly, and I don't mind getting that question because it is a very, very important question. Uh both I and everyone who was a Bible student throughout the church age were taught from the Bible that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. That's why we, you have verses like Matthew 24, verse 50, because that was God's plan, that until we got near the end, uh, he did not want people trying to figure out the timing of the end because they couldn't anyway because God had hidden it, uh, that information deep within the Bible. But secondly, he wanted uh, them to be preoccupied about sending the gospel out into the world and making sure that they were crying to God for mercy because they could die at any time long before the end would come. It was far more important to know that uh, that the end for each individual was the moment of death. But as we study the Bible, we find that it was also God's plan that when we get near the end, very near the end of time, then God wanted the timeline of history, uh, the information about the very precise time of Christ's return to be very well known so that the whole world could be warned that judgment is all re almost here, just as Jonah was able to warn N uh, the Ninevites that in 40 days they were going to be destroyed. And so in our day, 
God has opened up the Bible uh, to the understanding of those who have been very carefully searching the Bible and have been trusting the Bible that it uh, is truly from the mouth of God and is absolutely dependable and trustworthy. And we have learned that, yes, God has given us uh, 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 information. As a matter of fact, again and again, God said, but those who watch... Now, people have been watching, and they haven't, and the only place we can watch is in the Word of God. But the fact is that uh, it, it, when in our day, as we're watching, that is, as we're diligently searching these things out in the Bible, we do find we can know more. And that's why, and I hope that everybody listening becomes just thoroughly familiar with First Thessalonians chapter 5. Because it says it as plain as anything can be said. And it is, uh, it is fr- from the mouth of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2. It speaks directly to your question. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Which is exactly the position that all of us held a few years ago and all the way back throughout the church age. We That's what... That was our position. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. Uh, But then God now, but now God has something more to say. He says, for when they shall say, that's the next verse, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Now what, what's God talking about? He's told us that he's coming as a thief in the night, and then he's going to say, when you feel secure in your salvation, then you're going to suddenly be destroyed. How can that be? Well, because now we're living in at a different time. We're right near the end, and there's a lot more information that we should begin to know, and we better listen carefully. And he describes this in verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. In other words, there are those uh, at some point in time who will be living in the world, and that point in time is right now, because we're right near the end of time. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light. And the children of the day, and are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be of sound mind. Watching, you'll find in, in uh, again and again, where God is talking about time, even where he's talking about you don't know the day or the hour, He at, at the same time, he'll... He'll emphasize watching. And as as the true believers have been watching, when we finally have come to this time in history, as we have been watching, as true believers have been watching, they've suddenly began to find that all kinds of time information has opened up to them and that we do know, we do know the day and the month and the year uh, with great certainty from the Bible. And the fact that this could happen was already anticipated in Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, where God says, If therefore thou shalt not watch, then I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon you, or what the time will be when I come upon you, if you're not watching. Now, uh, people could watch all through New Testament history, and they couldn't learn anything more except that Christ was coming as a thief in the night. But when we finally come to this time, when we're right near the end of time, and God is opening up this information because we have to declare it to the world that Judgment Day is almost here. We have to warn them that this is the last opportunity for salvation and that there is a great salvation program underway outside of the churches. Uh, then uh, 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 at that time, we'll find that as we watch, we do know way more than that he's coming as a thief in the night. We will know the day and the month and the year. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, you know, I every time I read First Thessalonians five, I think of all my friends and loved ones, and and uh, and uh, the enormous number of people in the local congregations, and they're not watching. They are content with, well, we've always been taught Christ is coming as a thief in the night. What's new? What they're revealing is that they're not listening to the Bible. They are listening to their church. That is, that is their authority. That is their God. They're not making the Bible their God because the Bible is the Word of God. That is what we have to serve. That is what we have to worship. And and if we're not back continuing to l- listen to the Bible, then we are we are deceiving ourselves. We think we're worshiping Christ. We think all is well because we've been baptized and we are a faithful member of a congregation. But in reality, we are only following our church. We are not following the Bible. And that is, puts us in a terrible position of still being under the whole wrath of God. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Camp, and we were just talking about Caiaphas, the high priest and the scribe, seeing Jesus coming on the, on the right hand of uh, Powell in the clouds. Yes. And I think we got cut off. But I wanted to... Um, Usually allow people a couple of uh, questions, but I want to. There's a beautiful uh, sister verse to this, or a commentary, because here in, in um, Matthew 26, verse 64, it says, "Ye shall see." That word "see" is optimized, not the Greek word "ido." It's optimized. It's where we get optic from. Mm-hmm. You shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. That's what happened in Acts chapter seven when Stephen was being stoned. He saw Jesus sitting on the right hand, of, standing on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, if we go to Revelation 1-7, it says the same thing. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall, future tense, shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kingdoms of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. And there's a further commentary in First Thessalonians chapter 4. This tells us when it's going to happen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in clouds. Yeah, now, we now, the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yeah, now, excuse me. Now, you're talking about the word seeing. We have to let God define this matter of seeing. We already saw, looked at this word in in John chapter 1, in connection with Nathaniel, did he see heaven open, literally, and angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man? Absolutely not. He did not see. What did he see? He saw the uh, progression of the gospel as people did become saved. In other words, he saw what he really saw was the truth of the Bible. Now, again, God uses the word see, the same word see that he used in, in Matthew 26 uh, about seeing Christ coming on the clouds of glory he, in John 3. We read there in verse 3, except a man be born again or born from above, he cannot see. That's a different the word. Ki- excuse That's me. That's a Greek word, ido. That's not the same word, see. Okay, well, all right. It, 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 maybe I, I haven't checked that out recently, but we do find that word see again and again. Uh, that it has to do with what we see, we see through the Bible. It doesn't mean that we see, it certainly is the same word in John chapter 1. Uh, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open. Ye shall see heaven open. Did Nathaniel ever see heaven open? And you can make it, you see, you can, 
you can decide, and that's your good pleasure to do, that, well, the words is C. And I will refuse to accept that in any way except that I see it with my physical eye. Well, you can do that, but that doesn't mean that's what God is teaching. And the fact is that, uh, that we are in total harmony. When we relate John 121 about the the situation with Nathaniel and the and with the and the situation with the high priest, we're in total harmony. But if we are going to insist that we have to physically see it, well, okay, take that position. Uh, but it means that you're not you're not listening to the whole Bible. I'm sorry to say. But thank you. Ladder Rain Family Radio Supporters. Are you familiar familiar with that website? Hello? It's Ladder Rain Family Radio Supporters. Excuse me. I know there are many websites that are struggling with these questions and saying all kinds of things, and and everybody has an idea, and some write very well, and and they uh, uh, they uh, have their ideas, but uh, that's their business. They're not family radio. They're not. Uh, uh, I have no idea what they are saying. All I know is is what the Bible is saying. And uh, and uh, I'm not afraid to to uh, face any verse that they want to offer or anybody wants to offer. Not that I know every verse, but I know that uh, I I do find that in my own study of the Bible that that uh, all these all these factors begin to tie together more and more tightly. Uh, uh, even as we I found, for example, uh, as we talked about the timing of the end. First, it was somewhat, yes, probably, maybe, and then gradually, as we learn more and more and fit more and more verses into it that had to do with the subject, it began to lock in tighter and tighter. And it's the same with this matter of judgment. And so I I am fully aware, and you know, I, I, that's one of the problems with a lot of websites. There's lots of discussion going on, and you try, try to try to work through that discussion. What is, what do they really know, or what are they saying? And uh, and uh, but but uh, I I can't get I I can't get involved with that because I. Uh, I, I, anybody can call like you're calling on the open forum and I'll talk very openly and very, uh, def, uh, without, without uh, hesitating at all to look at any verse. And, and, uh, you cannot get, begin to understand this, this high priest, uh, seeing the Son of Man coming in power until you see the relationship to Nathaniel who saw heaven open. And I don't know whether these writers on the latter rain ever made that connection or not. About Psalm but, 146, four, Mr. Campin. Well, thank you for calling Mr. and Campin, sharing. Psalm yeah. All right, it's one more verse. Okay. Psalm 146, 146, verse 4. All right, let's look at that. 146. And I just want to focus on this word perish because I have one, two other verses to define what this word perish is. 146, verse 4. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to this earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. Jonah 4.10 uses that same word, perish. Well, but that is, that's true. His thoughts perish. They, they come to an end. He's not thinking anymore when he dies. This, this verse is, is, it, is, is very plainly saying that when the breath leaves a man, he is like a beast that dies. His body, body and soul, he is dead. Like God uses in Joshua chapter 10, he says there were all the souls in these cities were destroyed, and in that very day his thoughts perish. He's dead. He is dead. Mr. Campbell, God defines it in Psalm 68, verse 2, what the word perish means, aside from Jonah. But in Psalm 68, 2, as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish. 
the wax is not annihilated, and I don't know well, what no, no, Jesus is no, annihilated. Excuse me, come on now. You picked out a very uh, uh, one verse. You'll find the word perish sprinkled all through the Bible, and you find one verse that is where uh, where you can say, well, the wax. Uh, the wax uh, didn't perish, it still exists. Well, no, I'm not so sure about that. When the wax is melted, the candle is gone. It's not serving any useful purpose at all. And you cannot make that now the proof that perish does not mean a cessation of existence. Or, and more than that, I can even, uh, I can even build on that a little bit. When our thoughts perish, there's still a corpse lying on the ground. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, but the thoughts, that man is dead, but he's still a corpse, but he's dead. And so that's very much like a candle. Where the candle had, the wax has melted, it, the wax is still there, but it's no longer a candle. It no longer has a wick in it. It's no longer able to uh, sustain a, the, the light of a candle. And so, uh, you got, you, you, that, that's not the way you do your homework on the Bible. You have to look at a whole lot of verses. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. I have called you earlier. I'm sorry to cut you off. I had a second question. You didn't give me a chance to get the second question. In uh, Matthew 10, uh, verses 37 to ver verse 38. Matthew 10, verse 37. And verse, down to verse 38. There we read, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Is that the verse? Yeah, but it goes down to 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Okay, no. Now my focus is on the cross now. Should we be wearing that cross, or is it, is it saying he is the cross? Uh, well... Uh, you see, when this this is a figure, a statement that we can identify with Simon of Cyrene. Remember when Jesus was uh, going from the judgment hall to be crucified, he was not able, he had no longer had strength to carry his cross. So the Roman soldiers put Simon of Cyrene into help him carry the cross. Now, did that mean that Simon somehow assisted in paying for our sins? No, not at all. It emphasizes the fact that Christ, uh, that as we serve God, we suffer with Christ. That is, uh, he, Christ was, was uh, beaten. Christ was uh, spit upon. Uh, Christ was, uh, was lashed uh, with many stripes so that he became weaker and weaker and could not carry the cross and and so uh, we too as we as we serve him we carry his cross it has nothing to do with making payment for our sins or assisting in making payment for our sins it simply means that when we are a child of god we're going to suffer just like christ suffered uh, 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 not the suffering of the atonement, not the suffering of payment for sin. That's in a separate subject altogether that only Christ could endure. Okay, but it's the suffering is, of being an a excuse me. It's the suffering of being an alien in this world. Okay, my question is: Do we need to wear that cross as a symbol that he was crucified, or uh, wouldn't have to? Of course we don't wear that cross. We can and we want to, but uh, that's not what God is talking about. He's talking about, are you ready to suffer for me? Later on in Colossians, for example, we read about completing the sufferings of Christ. We are the body of Christ. He came to bring the gospel, and he suffered. He was uh, maligned and ridiculed and, and uh, so on. And, and so, too, as we bring the gospel, we can expect to be maligned and ridiculed. We, care, we have to rec recognize we're going to suffer in this world if we become a true believer. 
But so, thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Brother Camping. Uh, Luke 9. Luke 9. Verses 49 and 50, please. Luke 9. 49 and 50. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followed not with us. And uh, Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. What is your question? Uh, one of my friends in church, she says, uh, she felt like nowadays the church, nobody is against Jesus, so they are still for Jesus. So uh, what, what's your take on that? Well, the, the, to, if, if we're not against him, well, now, if we're for him, it means that we're going to want to be faithful to the whole Bible. And uh, that, and uh, you could be uh, living in one country or another country and not know each other at all, and yet you're following the same Bible. Hold on, I'll finish answering this right after this message. We're looking at a very interesting verse in Luke chapter 9, verse 10, where, uh, or excuse me, where he... Uh, uh, a verse uh, in uh, Luke, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 49 and 50, where Jesus said, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. That's the key there, is for us. Now, to be for Christ means that we are completely subject to his truth, which is the Bible. Now, that does not mean that we're, uh, we're for Christ just because we say the Bible is the Word of God or that uh, we uh, uh, follow a lot of the doctrines of the Bible. It means that we believe the Bible is altogether the Word of God and is the only authority, and we are ready to, uh, to uh, bow to the authority any time we find a, uh, a doctrine we're holding is incorrect. And when churches, for example, hold a position that you can divorce for uh, after uh, after you are married for for adultery or something, they are not for Christ. They have their own interpretation of what they think is true. When they have a different method of interpretation than the Bible calls for, they are not for Christ. When they hold that Jesus is coming as a thief in the night and reject the idea we can know precise time, they are not for Christ. They are for their own theology, which they had built based on what they had understood from the Bible in years past, but they are not ready to surrender everything to the Bible. And so they are not for Christ. And so it just doesn't mean that just because two churches are religious or that two people are religious or, or, or talk a whole lot about the Bible, that they are both of them for Christ. Maybe neither is. The only way we can be for Christ is we, is when we really are ready to break before anything, any truth that the Bible offers and, and admit we were wrong and be corrected because we want to only be true to the Word of God. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to the Open Forum. So, Mr. Camping? Yes. I got a question about the uh, 2011, uh, May, May, is it May 21st? Yes. Um, is the Word of God itself, the Bible, that's going to remain here on earth after the uh, rapture? What about to the people who still are here after the true believers are raptured? Yeah, are they going to still have their churches and their Bibles and everything? 
I don't, well, I don't know. I, I, uh, the churches will still be here unless some of them may, may have been destroyed in the, uh, the great earthquake that probably will occur on the first day of that five months period. Uh, and uh, they still will have Bibles, certainly. But there will be no mercy, no grace of God, no salvation. No possibility of anyone else becoming saved. And actually, the, this world will not, no longer be the valley of the shadow of death. As we read in Psalm 23, the Lord's, uh, the good shepherd Psalm, uh, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of this death, the uh, shadow of death, the world will be the valley of death. There will be dead everywhere, uh, be, and it'll be a, a, a horror story that is absolutely beyond our imagination. And the people that were absolutely sure that they're going to heaven are going to be going through a shock and awe until they die, correct? Uh, uh, basically, yes. If they are still in a church... At that time, they still think that they're safe and secure. It's, it's guaranteed they're going to be, end up in that five months period. And to their utter horror, they're going to find out they are left behind. And that will add to the horror of the whole story because everything that they had hoped for is, it, it did not happen. And they find that they are being shamed by God in an enormous way, and and uh, there is no hope for them. Yeah, that makes sense, because it's a mere image of the days of Noah, correct? Well, it's very similar to the days of Noah. All those, you know, there were uh, men of uh, renown in that day, and, and when we search the, the Old Testament language of Hebrew, uh, the men of renown, we find that they were men, uh, as near as we can tell, who were the theologians of that day. And they're all left behind. Only Noah and his three sons and their respective wives uh, were saved. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping, good evening, sir. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, you know, I want to ask you a question, probably uh, a lot of people asking you the same question. I, uh, um, you know, the normal programming, on, it's not on the air, and uh, I just was wondering, you know, what, what's going on? Oh, what happened is we had a technological breakdown here in our, uh, down here in Oakland. Uh, let me just give an outline of the problem. You know, we uh, we have an enormous amount of technical equipment to be able to broadcast all over the United States as well as all over the world. We have a, a great amount of technical equipment. And we also recognize the possibility of a breakdown. And so we had installed already 10 years ago a very competent backup system so that if uh, we did get a breakdown in one part, uh, we could immediately go to a backup system but the problem is that uh, we uh, that te technology changes and and the system that we had installed uh, 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 was working fine but then we've got a breakdown and and we were not able to repair it because that particular uh, uh, backup system was no longer produced anywhere, uh, anywhere, and uh, and we didn't have time to order an updated new system uh, before this this uh, this uh, our main system also came down. And uh, what what I'm what I'm trying to say is, no matter how hard we tried to uh, to uh, make sure that we would have a backup system. And, and think of it, I, I, I think, you know, we've been broadcasting now for 49 years and we've never had an incident quite like this. And, uh, and yet, uh, 
uh, finally it caught up with us and uh, uh, then like uh, instant pudding we have to place orders for new equipment very expensive new equipment in order to reestablish a backup system and we're already working on that very seriously and 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 we are able to get some of our stations back up on the air in other ways uh, and uh, and uh, so that this when we get through with this experience in a few days or a couple of weeks we'll will be far more secure than we had ever been before. But I'll tell you, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's, uh, it, it, it's the kind of thing that can happen no matter, because uh, we, 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 uh, uh, the, the technology is changing so very rapidly in our day. But, but we'll be back up again. Uh, the major stations, our bigger stations, should be on the air in another day or two if they're not already. I know WFME is on the air, Sacramento's on the air, uh, Long Beach is, or uh, San Diego is on the air, and uh, uh, we're getting some of the other stations on the air by a substitute backup system until we can uh, reinstall the main system and be, have it secure for everything. But our translators are suffering. Some of our smaller stations are suffering. It's going to take us a little while. A little while, uh, Brother Camping, uh, uh, approximately how long you think? Oh, I have no idea. It depends on where you are, and and uh, in some cases it might be tomorrow or tonight. KFR in Long Beach. Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I can't answer that right at this moment. But uh, uh, in the meanwhile, the only recourse you have is Internet if you, if you happen to have a computer. I do have uh, a computer, but I, I have to learn how to get to, uh, to the, the I don't Internet. know how to do it. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm sorry. Then just pray that God will uh, help us to expedite this as fast as possible. I, I will. Thank you, Father. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hello, Brother Camping. Uh, let me turn off my radio. Uh, can you go to uh, Luke 10, 36? Luke 10, verse 36. Uh-huh. There That's we right. read. Now, which of these three... Uh, is talking about the uh, the uh, good Samaritan. Now, which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? There was the there was this man who fell among the thieves, and there was a Samaritan that came by. And well, first of all, ahead of that, there was a priest, and there was a rabbi, I believe, or a Levite that came by. And they walked across the other, to the other side of the street. They would not give any help to this individual. And then the Good Samaritan came by and, and uh, took care of this individual in a very wonderful way. Which one was neighbor to him? That was the question. And, of course, it was the Good Samaritan that was neighbor to him. Now, what is your question? Okay. Uh, the, 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 the question here is related to love our neighbor. Love our neighbor. So when God commands us to love our neighbor, he's actually saying love him because he's the good Samaritan. Well, you, you've, you've asked a very practical question. Who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is not just the man or the family that lives, lives next door to us. It's anybody in the world who has a need. And the need that the Bible is concerned about is not a physical need, but a spiritual need. Because every human being by nature is under the wrath of God and must hear the gospel. Because it's through the gospel that God saves those that he plans to save. And so when God says, love your neighbor as yourself, uh, this is the kind of love we are to have for our neighbor. Now, what is the highest good we can have for ourselves in our self-love? Well, we want to make sure that we have eternal life. We'd like to know for sure that we're safe for eternity. 
And that can only be if we have truly become saved. So we have cried to God for mercy, and and uh, and God in His mercy uh, may have saved us. Well, then we are to love our neighbor the same way, that we want the highest good for him, namely that he might become saved. And that's anyone in the world. That's why we send the gospel all over the world, so that all of our neighbors... Which, are, which includes the whole world, might also have opportunity to hear the gospel because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So here we go back to Luke ten thirty six. Jesus answered the question, which is your neighbor? The neighbor is the good Samaritan, which is a spiritual he, the Good Samaritan is a spiritual picture of God. Well, the fact... he comes and helps us. We are the, the, you know, the one that has fallen down on the road. So when he says, 1036, who is your neighbor? But, Answering but, the question. But you see, Christ here is the illust- illustration of what true love is. It but I'm trying it, to answer, ask the question, uh, well, excuse who me, is excuse the Excuse me, excuse me. The fact is that the Good Samaritan is the Lord Jesus, and in his love for those who became saved, he laid down his life. He gave everything in order that we might have the highest good. And that's a dramatic picture of love. And that's why Jesus in another place says, Greater love hath no man this than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. He could have just as well said his neighbor there. Uh, that we are ready to surrender our joys in order that others might have salvation. That is, we, uh, that's why God says we are to lay our lives down on the altar of service. Uh, if we're a true believer, we're to, we are to be ready to give everything in order that the gospel might go out so that people might become saved. Because that is the terrible situation that prevails in the world. Outside of salvation, there's only death. There's only destruction. There is only the wrath of God. And the neighbor is anyone in the whole world who is still not saved. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Um, could you please um, go to Ezra 7, uh, verse 7? Ezra 7, verse 7? Uh, yes. All right, let's turn to that. Ezra 7, verse 7. Um, let's get the context. Verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which Jehovah God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request according to the hand of Jehovah his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nephinims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, what is your question? Um, is that a picture of um, the believers going up? And I believe in verse 8 it says um, he comes in the fifth month. Is that, the, is that the beginning of the fifth month or when the believers go up uh, before the fifth uh, month? Well, it's... it's uh, In a sense, yes, it really is, because the end of the 70 years, this came after the end of the 70 years, that typifies the time of great tribulation, which is followed by Judgment Day, but at the head of Judgment Day comes the rapture, when all the true believers are brought safe and secure, into the kingdom of God. That is, they are caught up to be with Christ in heaven. And so, yes, it would parallel that, I do believe. Um, um, I'm not as well a knowledge as you are in the Bible, but could you uh, perhaps give me another verse to go go with that, like to to compare scripture? scripture? I'm just trying to figure out the timeline and everything. What is another verse to go with this verse? Uh, Yeah. 
Do you have you a verse to offer? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't. I, yeah, I'm well, I, 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 I'm, I can't help you right at this moment. I, uh, I've never really looked at this verse that carefully before, so I, I'm sorry, I'm not qualified to help you on that. Thank you. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, every now and then on one of your Bible studies, you'll say, oh, um, we have a marvelous thing like we landed on the moon, um, or like you mentioned something fantastic about this world. Did you know that we really didn't land on the moon, that it was staged right here on Earth, that I don't want to see you be deceived? I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. I don't really have a, I have a comment that you, um, every now and then on your Bible study, oh. you mention the oh. fact that we landed on the moon, that you'll be talking about the moon. Well, the, I, the, I just don't want you to be deceived. Do you know that we that that was staged right here on the Earth, and they fooled the whole world? Oh well, I, I don't want to get into that debate. I've heard that that rumor that that was all staged, and and I don't I don't agree with that at all. I truly yeah. believe that that they did land people on the moon all together. It's not important that we know this, but the fact is there. Uh, I'll tell you, <laughs> there are always people who have come up with some kind of a position that in order to get attention, whatever, they talk about the Bermuda Triangle, or they talk about uh, spaceships, or they, uh, uh, and so on and so on, and they'll always have a certain, they'll write very, uh, very well and very interestingly, and there are always some people who will, think, well, these people know something, and we better trust them. But uh, but uh, uh, just because you read those kind of things, that doesn't mean there's any truth in it whatsoever. There's just way too much evidence uh, that, the, indeed, uh, the... Uh, the spaceship did land on the moon, but uh, let's let's not debate that question at all. It's not that uh, uh, that is uh, not really important. Finally, but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, call please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Okay. With your study of the Bible, have you ever? Because there's something to show whether that Solomon. Uh, died as a child of God with everything he went through? Did Solomon die? Yes. You know, this is a very, very uh, difficult question to answer when we read about the life of Solomon, because on the one hand, he, uh, God had so many wonderful things to say about Solomon, and yet in his old age he worshipped other gods because he uh, there was a sin in his life he never dealt with, namely that sin of uh, of uh, multiplying wives, and uh, they finally ca caused him to even worship other gods in his old age. Now the Bible. In the case of David, when he committed grievous sin of adultery or fornication with Bathsheba and then murdered her husband, uh, we find uh, lots of information in the Bible concerning his, his remorse and how bad he felt about all of that. It was really, it was really, uh, uh, we know that uh, David was still definitely a child of God. But we don't read about that with Solomon. God did not see, see fit to, to put that kind of information in the, the Bible. But on the other hand, in order to make sure that we still understand that Solomon was a child of God, even though there's a lot of information about Solomon's life that God did not tell us about, we read in, in uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 26, Did not Solomon 
Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things. Yet among many nations there was there no king like him who was beloved of his God. That's a, that's the giveaway statement. To be beloved of God, uh, that applies to those who are children of God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. And it's a warning to us that even though God loves us, we can really fall into sin if we take our eyes off Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, it seems that um, I'm learning that all the churches are, are calling on the name of Jesus. They're always saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then I read just two days ago, not having a clue about this, in Revelation 19, I think it's 11 or 12 or 13, that uh, the Messiah will have a new name. Yes. Well, that, that all the believers will have a new name. Oh, is that the believers and Christ, or is that... Uh, uh, well, in verse 16 of Revelation 19, he hath on his vesture, on, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, Christ has many, many names. He is uh-huh. called, his name is faithful, his name is true, his name is the Word of God, his name is Christ, his name is Messiah, uh, his name is Savior, his name is Lord of Hosts. Uh, all of these names uh, 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 are not not uh, names for identification, but to tell us something about the nature of Christ. And uh, so, uh, uh, but we who are believers, we uh, uh, have been uh, uh, sons of this world. And when we become true believers, we enter into the family of God so that we truly be, take on the name of Christ. Now, it's curious, you know, the name Christian was first given, used by the Christians in Antioch uh, during the early time when the early church was uh, really beginning to go out uh, in, uh, in Turkey, in the land of what now we, the nation we call Turkey, and at Antioch, they began to call themselves Christians, which means of the family of Christ. And that name now is taken by about two billion people in the world. According to the World Almanac, there's about that many people who identify themselves as Christian. And yet, uh, that doesn't mean that two billion people are of the family of Christ. It indicates that they think they are that they would like to be, but the true number of true believers is a far smaller number, uh, even though it's a great multitude today that is being saved, and only when we become a true child of God are we really, have we really taken on the name of Christ uh, so that we are true, true Christians. But thank you for calling uh, uh, and sharing, and shall we take the next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Mr. Camping. I know we only have a minute. Could you please read me uh, one scripture, and then I have one question about it. Uh, it's Matthew 24, verses 21 to 22. Matthew 24, verse 21. There we read... And whoso shall swear by... No, that's 23. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Yes, I was just wondering, um, if the elect aren't going to be here, why would the days be shortened? I mean, if the elect are left, wouldn't they be saved? Because the Great Tribulation is not the day of judgment. It comes before the day of judgment. It is a preparatory time for the day of judgment, and the believers will be here during the Great Tribulation. But with that, I have to say good night. We've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.